Well, there's been a lot going on uh, in Washington this week, to say the least. Uh, the investigation into what happened in Benghazi, what happened to General Petraeus. We're going to talk to our panel now, uh, back again, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius, longtime defense writer for the Washington Post, Tom Ricks, now the author of a new book called The Generals, American uh, Military Command from World War II to Today and CBS News State Department correspondent Margaret Brennan. Margaret, welcome to you. And CBS News Justice uh, correspondent Bob Orr, who's been following uh, all of this uh, situation. Let's talk, let's just start here at home. Uh, where are we on all of this situation involving these uh, investigations into General Petraeus, into Benghazi? I mean, Bob, uh, how many investigations are going now? I know of three right now, Bob. The CIA Inspector General doing an internal review of whether or not uh, former director Petraeus misused any agency assets during his 14 months on the job. So that's number one. Number two, the Department of Defense Inspector General is looking into these communications and emails between uh, General Allen and Joe Kelly, this Tampa socialite. And there's some interesting developments there. This started out as a raft of information. We were told 20 to 30,000 emails uh, and communications back and forth. And then that was adjusted downward to a couple of hundred now we're told it's just a handful of questionable and perhaps problematic emails. And then, of course, the third track involves Paula Broadwell, the biographer of Petraeus. And the FBI still has an investigation into Broadwell because of her handling and per perhaps her mishandling of classified information. Uh, and beyond that, there could be other investigations, frankly, that we're not aware of. You know, uh, Tom Rex, I was struck by something you wrote uh, in an op-ed or something someplace uh, where you said uh, you didn't approve of uh, General Petraeus and Paula Broadwell, but you also thought it was none of your business. Uh, elaborate on that a little bit. I think there are two scandals in the whole Petraeus affair. The first scandal is why the FBI was looking into lovers' quarrels. The second, and more troubling to me, is that we seem to care more about the sex lives of our generals than the real lives of our soldiers. Everybody can tell you the name of Pro Paula Broadwell. Nobody can tell you the name of the Americans killed in Afghanistan in the last week. I saw some stats that said there were about 50 casualties in Afghanistan, which is dead and wounded, and since Petraeus, or the Petraeus affair came out. Nobody's paying attention to that. Uh, to me, a real scandal is that we tolerated years of mediocre generalship in Iraq before Petraeus actually did a good job there. A real scandal is that we've had 11 years of, and 11 commanders in Iraq. That's no way to run any business or any operation, that, that fast turnover. Uh, I come away wondering why Americans don't pay attention to these wars until they become titillating. Uh, David, is that because we now have the all-volunteer force and, and uh, uh, you know, people who don't have a relative or someone they know involved in the military? And, you know, I know a lot of people that don't know a single person in the military. I mean, I can remember World War II as a little boy. Uh, everybody knew somebody that was involved. Somehow now we don't seem to know the people in the military and they don't know us anymore. Is this what Tom's talking about part I, of that? I think so. To a disturbing extent, the military has become a different tribe in American society. It's a, it's a tribe that Americans value enormously from a distance. When soldiers are, walk through airports, they, they get spontaneous uh, congratulations. When they walk on airplanes, people stand up and want to shake their hands. I had a, a senior military officer say to me a couple of days ago, this is not a healthy situation for us. We need to be part of the country. We need, we need to be judged by, by, by reasonable standards. But Tom makes a great point that we need to judge our, our generals by their performance. And, and if their performance isn't, isn't good, we shouldn't sing their praises as these wonderful volunteers. Who, you know, we need to say uh, uh, perhaps another commander is, a, is appropriate. In the case of General Petraeus, the only thing I'd, I'd take issue with Tom about is, and I think General Petraeus would, would, would say this him, himself, CIA personnel are expected to report any contact they have with people who could have power over them, who, who could be in a position where they, they knew things that the disclosure could, could be embarrassing or worse and make, make the official with classified information vulnerable. And uh, CIA personnel are held to that rule, and you have to hold the director to it. And I, I, it's clear that General Petraeus recognized the fact of that. That doesn't go to some of the larger issues that are being spun as this thing gets yeah. faster and faster. Uh, Margaret, uh, 
perhaps more important than all of that is this investigation going on into what actually happened in Benghazi. Uh, where are we in all of that? I mean, you heard John McCain this morning, then you heard Dick Durbin, and, and then you heard Olympia Snow. Uh, how is this impacting out at the State Department? This is one of the most sensitive topics. People feel very personal uh, and take this in, in a very personal way, this attack. But then you also get Foreign Service officers on the sidelines who will say to you, we are very concerned about security. We are very concerned about other soft targets out there. The DO Department of Defense and the State Department are reviewing other compounds right now to see if other Benghazis could exist. There's a real question about the relationship between the CIA and the State Department, how they coexist in some of these locations and support each other. But we're really stuck in this lightning rod right now, this question of why the T word and Al Qaeda were classified when we knew within the first 24 hours that there was credible intelligence that suggested that's what happened in Benghazi. Well, well let, me, let me just ask the obvious question. I asked, uh, I asked Olympia Snow, why were they so reluctant to talk about terrorism? I mean, uh, Bob? You know, the people I talked to at the CIA and other places around town knew pretty early on that there were elements of Islamic radical groups involved in the attack. Uh, specifically, this group in Libya, Ansar al-Sharia, and some tentacles reaching out to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, so early on, they knew there were some loose associations, if nothing else, of people who participated in this attack on the consulate. When the information got uh, over to the White House, uh, al-Qaeda became extremists. And when uh, Susan Rice went on television, went on this program, uh, to talk about what she knew, uh, she took perhaps the most benign mm -hmm. uh, interpretation of the information in front of her. But to be clear, this happened in the political season when everything is politicalized uh, and put well, through the prism. And I think that the, it's, we knew what we knew at the beginning and that really hasn't changed. Well, do we think that they changed this around? I mean, for political reasons, Tom? I think the phrase in the political season mm -hmm. is the most important phrase. Uh, it really strikes me is that no one can tell me how many security contractors were killed in the Iraq war. And I've, I've looked into this, uh, working on my, my books on, on the Iraq war. Uh, everybody seems to tell you about four people in Benghazi. So I'm a little bit suspicious of the motive in talking about Benghazi so much when nobody's paid attention to this stuff for years. Bob, I, I would just make one point. The, the dirty little secret here is that our intelligence analysts don't know even now mm -hmm. how all these factors came together outside the consulate on the night of September 11 so that the consulate was overrun. And, and, and that was the, one of the problems in the days immediately after. They did have intelligence that people linked with Al Qaeda were in that crowd. But in terms of pre-planning of, of directives from Al Qaeda in the Maghreb or yeah. other senior Al Qaeda leaderships to those people uh, to do something, they don't have that. They had very quickly intelligence that people in that group that attacked the consulate were watching what happened in Cairo live on TV and they had surveillance of them talking about it mm -hmm. and then they go to the consulate to attack. So they were trying to figure out what's the mix of that spontaneous driver and the fact that we know that they're part of organized terrorist groups and you know there is a fog of intelligence analysis and that's a part of what you're well, seeing. Well, I, what I am uh, having trouble with is anyone, no one should be more informed on what the situation is in a country than the ambassador. Mm. He should have access to all the intelligence and ambassadors do. Uh, why would the ambassador go to Benghazi on the anniversary of 9-11? Obviously, that was uh, a date uh, to be uh, considered in any kind of movement. Why, why did he go, Margaret? He was supposed to be there to open a, a cultural center there in Benghazi. That's why he was officially there. We may not get some of the answers to these questions until Secretary Clinton goes to the Hill with the probe that the State Department did in her hand. Sources tell us that probably won't be until the end of December. A lot of that information is going to be about the questions that the State Department has asked themselves. It won't necessarily get us inside the White House. It won't necessarily get us inside the CIA and some of their decision making, but it will lay out what happened, when the requests were made for security, and why perhaps they weren't fulfilled in the way that some have said in hindsight they should have been. Bob, I want to go back to you with all these investigations that are going on. Uh, do you see any prosecutions coming here? 
there's going to be a lot of political pressure, I think, mm -hmm. on the FBI at the end of the day to produce something. That's just my opinion. But you have uh, the CIA director stepping down. You have General John Allen, who's nominated to be the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, now under a cloud of suspicion. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's hard to imagine you just kind of dust your hands off and say, well, that was messy. Uh, I think there's going to be at least some internal and probably external pressure on the FBI to pursue a case, and most likely against Paula Broadwell, I think. Uh, the one thing that might be prosecutable that we know about was her handling of classified information. Uh, she had clearance to have access to the classified information. What she didn't have, and what people with clearances don't have, is permission to take that information outside of the secure realm. Uh, they found it in her home, they found it on her files, and we need to make a point. She's been cooperative with investigators about this, and it really would be a relative smack on the hands, I think, to prosecute that charge. But nevertheless, it might produce something at the end of the well, day. Well, you know, and that's something that it is not to, it's not taken lightly in security circles. So who was it? John Deutsch? Yes. Who was the former uh, CIA director. Was, former was CIA for director who was fired uh, because he took classified information home mm -hmm. with him. So uh, I don't know. It all reminds me of the nanny tax kerfuffle of about 15 years ago. Uh -huh. If you hang around the U.S. military, you're constantly getting classified information. It is handed to you to explain things. If you embed with, with a headquarters in Bagram or something, you sit in on intelligence briefings. So this sort of technical thing of you had it on the wrong laptop, I just find that sort of the smallest bureaucratic possible outcome uh, and almost meaningless. What's going to happen in Israel, David? Well, I, I think Israel is poised, ready to attack, showing it's ready to attack. I don't think it wants to. The question that, that I hear Israelis and, and U.S. officials asking is, where does this lead? I mean, is Israel really in a situation where it has no alternative but every five or six years to take a pop at, at its adversaries, which is what one Israeli official told me, or is there some pathway toward greater stability? And could it involve the new government in Egypt, which is close to Hamas and could draw Hamas, could take more ownership of events? So that's where I think everybody would like to see it head. Obama's worked hard to talk to Morsi and to Erdogan in Turkey to try to steer it in that direction. Will that happen? Uh, usually the right bet in the Middle East is that, is that good things won't happen. And the most phone calls that Secretary Clinton has made from the road have been to her counterpart in Egypt. And they have been very clear that Egypt has the relationships, they have the credibility, and they have the influence in the region to push Hamas to stop the attacks. Now, there is also a fair amount of funding being held up in Washington right now that the Egyptians need very immediately. Remember, they weren't just one of the top recipients of foreign aid, they have a funding crisis. They have literally been to the point where they have had problems paying bills. Mm -hmm. And so there are there is some immediate leverage to get them to act immediately. Whether that ends up being effective or not is another question. Well, do we think, uh, do we think the administration, uh, obviously, I, I, would, I would guess they're advising the Israelis not to invade. Uh, but what beyond that are they, are they trying to do? Uh, is this an opening to start a, the peace process to get it started again, David? Or? If, Bob, if, if, if Morsi and Erdogan of Turkey, those key players, uh, in working toward a ceasefire, we're likely to have a ceasefire here. We'll either have a ceasefire mm -hmm. or we'll have an Israeli invasion. If there's a ceasefire, that is the kind of thing that can be a building block. And if you can pull everybody together, as mad as the Egyptians will be, as indignant, that, that's the start of a process of discussion. That would be a good step. Do you think Lebanon's next? Well, if, if some people think that what this is about is in preparation for a likely war with Iran, mm -hmm. Israel testing the, 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 the rockets that would be fired against it from Gaza, next from Lebanon, so that we may see something with Lebanon soon for, because it's a preliminary. This is the kind of warm up round for the real conflagration that's ahead that involves Iran. You really think there's a chance that Israel would uh, strike Iran and try to take out those nuclear? Yes, especially given the timing of the Gaza thing. They waited until after the American elections are over, and now they're getting down to business. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, let's hope everything comes out well here. <laughs> I'm not sure we got any information that indicated it will here today, but there, we can always hope. Uh, we'll be right back.